Zoom in China. Okay, perfect. Now it's been recorded. Perfect. I met I met Chung uh, first in Paris when he was another uh, a PhD student, and I was there precisely for the third exams. And he he is an amazing mathematician. I would say I have learned many things from Chung. And indeed, I hope that I can collaborate one day with Chung uh, and, and we have time to collaborate uh, together. So for me, it has been a, a honor to meet Chung. And then I, I went in 2019, I visited mm -hmm. China, I visited Shanghai, and then Chung was uh, very nice to come and guide me in mm -hmm. Shanghai. And then we made this promise that I would come back to Enan, but well, so far this has not happened. This is why I'm here and I'm very honored to see so many people interested in this course. So what I'm going to, to do is I'm going to try to use my iPad and I'm going to try to share the screen share your story. from my yeah. iPad. And I will okay. show you, okay, this requires some, um, some concentration from my side. Let me see if I can manage to do this. Uh, Okay, I have to do screen mirror and connect my iPad. Good. We are there. Perfect. Good. So um, <clears throat> what I wanted to, to show you, well, first of all, is that yesterday, well, I decided to, to, I thought it would be a good idea, and now I realize it's an excellent idea to have a website, okay? The ones who are arriving, uh, you have this website in the chat. I will repeat because now I cannot, if I'm sh screen sharing, I cannot uh, use uh, the, the chat because I would need to and screen uh, to, I don't know how to use the chat when I'm sharing. So I will post again at the end of my talk in the chat, the, the link to this website. Essentially, this is just uh, directly in my in my website, and I will also link it from the first uh, web from the from the website. This is in my server, and the server of our yeah. university takes a while to update. So even if I have already updated, this is a still. I mean, this is something you can see, but not the direct link from my website. So well, this is a little bit the plan of what I want to do today. Well, the plan is to to start to introduce. Uh, the objects. I'm going to be, I mean, I know that there are people connected here who know this by heart, who know this very good, but I'm just aiming at the students here, okay? Uh, so, well, if you know this, I mean, I hope that you can still enjoy and learn something, but I'm, I'm thinking of, of, the, of the students, okay? So today I'm going to be very basic, and I plan to, if you don't know anything about symplectic geometry, this is not a problem. I'm going to start exactly there at defining the objects in symplectic geometry. My, okay, I, when I prepared these slides, well, I reached, I wanted to reach the point of Poisson manifolds, but we will see because we have started a bit later. We'll see if like uh, Chosen, you will let me know if you want to count one hour and a half from now or from, or from seven, because it's going to be very late for you afterwards, right? So maybe- uh, No problem, you, you may- uh... I, I think you may go as your scaled, uh, your scaled. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. Okay. Well, I don't know because for you it's a bit late if you want to have dinner. Just, I mean, I can make, well, I mean, we'll, we'll, we will see. So today I want to reach, let's say, this scenario where we go from symplectic to Poisson geometry and we have these examples. And why are we interested in such examples? So that's the plan. I have a schedule, I, 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 this course is a, a different version of other courses I have done before on the subject. And I think I have learned that it's very important to have problem sessions. This is something that I have learned with practice. So I have a program, a problem set, an exercise session for next week on Thursday. And for this, you see here connected, Paumir, uh, who is connected here, and Joaquin Bruges, who is probably connected but without the camera. Uh, both of them are going to help me in these problem sessions. And as I was explaining before, for the ones who were not connected yet, the plan is that on this Thursday, already probably tomorrow night, you'll have the list of problems available for the first session. Okay, maybe for the two sessions, because we have a lot of problems in that list. And you can start uh, thinking of how to solve them. 
And the idea is that you can contact us, especially Pau and Joaquim. I will provide the contact data. They are still not on the website. You can contact them before asking questions. If you want to have a short meeting with them to discuss the solution of the problems. And then next Thursday, we will do a problem session that well, where of course I'm going to be there. Uh, but the main idea is that Pau and Joaquim are the ones who solve the problems or if some of the students wants to solve the problems and go on this virtual uh, whiteboard, let's say by sharing the screen, uh, this is perfect, okay? That's, that's the idea. The idea is that we get participation from students. And the idea is that please, uh, this is something I, I, I will not say enough, but please stop me if you don't understand something. Send me emails if you don't understand something, ask me questions. Feel free to do this any moment, okay? To interrupt me, etc. I mean, this is a course, and the idea is that uh, people need to understand uh, the, the, the objects I introduced today because they will need them for the problem sessions of next week. Okay, so that's a little bit the planning. And the planning is really to get to the last things. The finale is the, the last uh, results that we are proving, indeed with Joaquim and Cedric, uh, in flow homology. So this is very ambitious, okay? This is an ambitious program. I hope I can reach uh, the end because usually I am. I, I end up being too ambitious about this. And okay, let me, let me now share the, let me close this. Okay, and let me uh, open this file, okay? That's uh, for the ones, I mean, for the ones, uh, that's the website, precisely, where you can download the slides. Indeed, you can download all the material. If you have the slides, when you click, you go uh, straight to the, to this set. Maybe I can also share these slides. I have them in my Dropbox. I can also share them directly from the Dropbox or for, well, they are on the website. Okay, so today I will, introduce a little bit the motivation to consider geometry and dynamics of singular symplectic manifolds, okay? And I'm not going to assume that people know about symplectic manifolds. So I'm going really to introduce uh, everything from scratch. I'm going to start by two-dimensional manifolds and everyone here knows that the topological classification of compact surfaces is given uh, is, is, I mean, this is what we study. If we have a connected closed surface, uh, it's either homeomorphic to a sphere, to a connected sum of tori, or connected sum of real projective spaces. And that's the classification that we have uh, of topological manifolds. Then a natural question is what happens if you add additional structures? Okay. Well, what uh, probably you also know is that if you add a differential structure on a surface, you have the same classification. And another, and, and what is very classical and what you have learned in the undergraduate courses is what happens when you add a Riemannian structure. And then you know that the classification, uh, that the classification has some invariants that are even local invariants in particular, Curvature is an invariant of this classification. If you look at, at, at this Riemannian structure, most of the literature that of the undergraduate studies in, pro, in terms of classification, problems in geometry is guided by Riemannian structures. So we assume that we have a metric on the manifold, okay? And then we try to understand what does it mean a classification problem. Two objects are going to be the same, we say the same or in the same class, if there exists a diffeomorphism taking one object, one manifold to the other and taking also this additional structure, the Riemannian structure to the other. Okay, and this is what, uh, that's the, the, the classical thing that you learn at the school in the undergraduate courses. You learn how to classify Riemannian objects. And, and you do this because Riemannian geometry it's very natural. It's inspired just by the measure of things. And that's an example of classification. But you can decide that you want to take a different metric, that you want to take a different way to measure on the manifold. For instance, instead of taking a Riemannian structure, 
you may want to classify uh, surfaces if you take an area form, okay? And that's a very natural question. That would correspond to taking a geometrical structure, which is anti-symmetric, okay? Here, we could take a tensor, which is anti-symmetric, okay? And then the way to formulate the idea of area form in the language of geometry using differential forms is to take a differential form. We can formulate an area form. This is a surface on a surface. The idea of area form, which is an anti-symmetric tensor, we can also formulate it using forms, differential forms, by taking a two form on the manifold. So I am assuming that people know what are differential forms. And I'm going to assume that this two form is closed. And that's important. If this two form is closed, one thing we know from topology is that this defines a class in the cohomology of the manifold, okay? I can think in the ramp cohomology, I can think in singular, uh, co co in the dual of singular homology, it doesn't matter. Let's think on the ramp cohomology. So I know this defines a class because this is a, a form, a two form, which is closed. And well, in the case of surfaces, I'm going to assume that omega doesn't vanish, okay? The condition that omega doesn't vanish is a condition that for higher dimensions is more difficult to formulate. But in dimension two, that's enough to define what is a symplectic structure on a manifold. Indeed, the symplectic on, on a structure on a manifold is just having an area form, okay? And then this, for instance, excludes totally the non-orientable manifolds. Why? Because if I have an area form on a two-dimensional manifold, this means I have a volume form Therefore, my manifold is oriented. So this means that by considering the anti-symmetric case, I'm taking out all non-orientable examples in my list of surfaces, in my classification list of surfaces. And then this question, this classification question of I have, now I have two surfaces, okay? First, they have to be, to be equivalent. I have a surface together with a, with a form. To be equivalent, first they have to be homeomorphic. They have to have the same topology. And this is equivalent to have the same uh, class in the classification as differentiable manifolds because for surfaces that's the same. Okay, so they have the same topology. And then we need to understand what does it mean to classify? It means that I have a surface that I'm going to assume that is the same topologically and that I have two different structures, omega zero and omega one, on this surface. And to say that they are equivalent or they, they are on the same class is the same as to say that there exists a diffeomorphism that pulls omega one to omega zero. That's the, our definition of equivalence of symplectic structures, okay? Then it's a theorem by Moser that indeed two area forms on a surface are equivalent in this sense that I have just introduced, if and only if their cohomology class is the same. Indeed, Moser did this to classify volume forms on a manifold. And that's the idea behind that I will I, I, I plan to explain, I, I plan to give the proof of this. The idea behind this, uh, it's a deep idea that still nowadays is used uh, in symplectic geometry, which is the idea of the formation. It's a Moser's path method. Moser's path method works with the idea that if two forms are on the same cohomology class, you can deform this. This is a topological idea. If they are on the same uh, class, you can deform one to the other. And the way to do this is very peculiar. It's explained in this slide, but I'm going to write this down. I'm going to give a, a whole proof here. I'm going to write this. Imagine that you have two forms, omega zero and omega one, that they are on the same cohomology class. 
What does this mean? Well, they are on the same cohomology class, if and only if, maybe I can write in blue now, omega one minus omega zero is a differential of beta, where beta is a one form. This is just a definition that the two forms are on the same cohomology class, okay? And now the idea of Moser that he applied this idea. Here we apply it to surfaces, to area forms on surfaces that we call symplectic forms. He did this for volume forms and it works the same, okay? It's a very interesting idea because it, it works for top forms on a manifold. You can do this game. Then his idea is the following, consider the following path. You take omega t, you take a path such that in time uh, one, I want to be in omega one and in time uh, zero, okay? So in time zero, I want to be in omega zero. So I take this path, I take a path of area forms. That's a path. Well, first, why it's a path of area forms? Well, you check very easily that this is going to be closed, okay? Because you take that this is the differential of omega t, it's just the differential of t omega one plus one minus t. So you can take the t out. I can take this t out here. And I can write this as the differential of omega zero. And this goes to zero, and this goes to zero, because I'm assuming that omega one and omega zero are closed forms. Therefore, this is a path of, of closed forms. And I can check, and it's easy to check that, uh, and I leave this as a small exercise, but easy to check, that if omega one is different from zero, let's say positive as an area form, and I'm going to assume that it's positive and omega zero is positive, all the linear path is positive. That's a, an exercise that maybe I can ask uh, next Thursday if people have done this. That works very well with area forms because essentially you can write down even in coordinates. And then if you have two forms, one has to be a multiple of the other. So it, it goes uh, very easily. Okay. So now the idea of Moser is that you can try to deform omega one to omega zero by using this path. And in order to do this, what he was considering is the form, the equation, the following equation. If you consider this equation, here what I'm doing is to contract, I'm contracting here, I'm contracting here. Uh, let me write this. This is Moser's equation. And what's important is that this is Yota. Okay. So I'm contracting. I'm this is the contraction of the form omega t with the vector field x sub t. What is x sub t? Now we go one by one here in this formula. Beta is got given. Beta is given here. Beta is this one form such that omega one minus omega zero is differential of beta. I'm putting a minus. I know it's necessary. We will need this minus for a cancellation later. And omega t is known because it's this path. Okay. That's the path. So these are data that are known. Okay. And this guy here, x sub t, is unknown. What is x sub t? x sub t is the, the only solution to this equation. 
then let's think a little, uh, uh, a small moment, why this solution has a unique equation? Because omega zero is positive. This is equivalent, omega t is positive. This is equivalent to this equation having an, uh, a unique solution, okay? Omega t positive, it means that for each beta and omega t, there exists a unique solution to this equation. This solution depends on t. Why? Because omega depends on t, okay? And now what we do is to take the uh, to take the flow of this vector field. But which flow? We take the flow satisfying, let me erase this. And now we take the flow, take T dependent flow. which satisfies the only solution to the differential equation i take the only solution to this differential equation and then the claim is that the pullback of omega t is omega 0 so in particular, when we take t equal uh, to one, we get that phi sub one star omega one equals omega z, okay? That's the claim. I should prove this claim. That's a big, big claim, okay? So the idea of Moser is take the linear path of symplectic forms or area forms, okay? This is a path of uh, area forms. The fact that this is a path of area forms uh, globally only works uh, for globally for manifolds. When we try to generalize this proof, it doesn't work in higher dimension. It just works in dimension two. Because in dimension two is where we completely understand uh, the classification of symplectic structures. Higher dimension is a complicated story. Okay, so, and then uh, what we do is we take beta, which is the one form satisfying this uh, equation because they are on the same class. So we use the condition that they are on the same class here. We have this uh, equation here. We get a unique vector field. And what we need to do is to integrate the flow of this unique vector field. And this flow is the one which gives us the equivalence between omega zero. I, well, I said, sorry, there is a big typo here, sorry. I saw zero and it's omega zero. It didn't make any sense. Omega zero, sorry. So what I say is that if we take the time dependent flow of this vector field, okay, then when we say, when we take t equal to one, then this uh, takes omega one to omega zero. And this is the one that gives us the equivalence. Can you prove this claim? This claim is like the most important. And now I'm going to do something that I love that you can do with the iPad, which is to make bigger because I need, I need to write smaller, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to write the proof of the claim here, maybe in red, proof of claim. And for this, I need some help and I need to use a formula. I'm going to use a formula that I will provide the proof in the, in the notes. The notes are still not online, sorry, but they will be online. Uh, I hope that today there will be a first version, which will not be perfect, but first version is better than nothing. Okay, so what, what I, I need to use, I need to use this formula, which is a derivation formula for uh, differential forms that, defer, that depend on an additional parameter. And when we do the differentiation in this parameter, and that's the equation I need to use, which is proved in the notes. And here I'm using, and I'm writing uh, forms that I hope that you already know. This is the Lie derivative. And of course, since we are talking about the Lie derivative, I need to assume 
another formula, that's one formula that it's in the proof. And another formula that I am assuming that everybody knows is Cartan's magic formula. You wouldn't be here if you wouldn't know this formula, I'm sure. I'm sure that you know this formula, which the one that tells us that the lead derivative, you can read it from the differential of the contraction plus the contraction of the differential. So I'm going to apply these two. I need these two formulas. I'm going to call them one and two, okay? And now I need to prove the claim. Plum, surprise, I'm going to do this here. The claim is, I'm going to use these two formulas, okay? And I need to prove that the pullback of omega t is omega zero, okay? So as I say to my students, well, this part here is depending on t. This part here is constant. Do you want to prove that something is constant? Just do the derivative. And then check that the constant is the right one by evaluating at t equal to zero. That's what we are going to do. So in order to prove this, this formula, we compute this derivative. And we check that it's equal to zero. That's what, I, that's what we need to do. And the second observation is that, well, when you know that this is equal to zero, this is telling you that this is constant. And what is that constant? You find this constant by evaluating at t equal to zero, okay? When I evaluate at t equal to zero, then what do I know about phi zero? Well, I know that phi t is the flow of a vector field, therefore phi zero, has to be the identity, okay? Therefore, if I evaluate, I evaluate this at zero, I, I get phi zero star omega zero, therefore omega zero, because phi zero is the identity, okay? Okay, that's good. So we just need to do the differential to believe this. So we go ahead, okay? We just need to, in order to do this differential here, so now I need to check this that this is equal to zero. What I'm going to do, of course, is to apply straight this formula of derivation. It has two terms, okay? So I need to, co to consider, in order to check this, I need to consider the first term, okay? This is the differential of omega t t. The first term is phi t star d omega t differential of t plus the differential of omega t. And now observe, well, the differential of omega t with respect to t is just the differential of the path that we have there, which is t omega one plus one minus t omega zero, okay? That's what you have, right? Now, if you do the differential of this, what you get, you get omega one minus omega zero. Oh, surprise. This is the differential of beta. Okay, so that's the first term here. Now I want to use some color. Pink is a good color for this. So this guy here, the differential of beta is this guy inside. And now let's analyze, and in this small space that I have, maybe let's change color, the lead derivative of omega t, okay? Because this is the second term. Okay? But now I apply Cartan's magic, here I have applied just, and I need to apply Cartan's magic formula, which we call two in this formula. We apply Cartan's magic formula. So we need to say that the lead derivative is the differential of the contraction plus the contraction of the differential. And this tells me, sorry, that this is, I wrote, this is the contraction of omega t plus the contraction ext 
D omega T, okay? But D omega T is zero, okay? Because we have checked it up. So I just need, I'm just left with this guy here. Mm, this rings a bell. Where did I see this? I saw this precisely up there. Uh, I saw this in Mozart's equation. So this gives me this minus. Now you understand why I needed the minus. I need it because this gives me minus differential of beta. I'm so happy. I need to add up plus the differential of beta minus the differential of beta. So this adds up to zero as I wanted. Okay, so this proves the claim, okay? And the claim, well, the, the, the good thing about the iPad is that you can write very small, but then you have to, okay, you have to learn this to, to read this. You have also, I leave the annotated version after my talk, because I think this can be convenient for you. I will also post it next to the, to the other slides. I will leave also the annotated version. So don't worry if you cannot take notes, so in any case, here, very small, I prove the claim. And because of the claim, everything makes sense. The claim is proving that the time one flow of this t-dependent vector field of x sub t, which is the solution to Mosser's equation. I, I have marked this. OK. I don't control so well my iPad. I have marked this, and I, I hope it didn't erase it. OK. So this is giving me exactly the, the, the equivalence because this diffeomorphism takes omega one to omega zero. So we have proved the theorem of Moser in full detail. Are there any questions about this proof? So this finishes the proof. Are there any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. If you leave something in the chat, I would ask uh, the host to, to, to read uh, the chat because, well, maybe I should have connected with my other computer too to see the chat because I, I cannot read the chat when I'm sharing the screen, okay? So feel free to ask questions. So I have uh, given a complete proof that this gives me the, the, the equivalence. I have proof, well, I have proved one implication. I have proved this implication here. I have proved that if the class, if the cohomology class is the same, then the, the area forms are equivalent. That's what I have proved. And that this proof is powerful. I have explained uh, then in full detail what is written here, the, the hints, the idea behind. I have expanded this. And this idea is very powerful. And I wanted to explain this idea because it works very well in symplectic geometry. And it's an idea that doesn't work at all, doesn't work at all in, in Poisson geometry in general. But we will make it work for some kind of Poisson structures. That's the spoiler. And that's why I wanted to make this. Okay, now let's go and define symplectic structures in full generality, okay? Uh, I started with the motivation of surfaces. I completely classify area forms. And it did this, this proof that I made works very well in, uh, for higher dimensions too. Uh, this precise proof with the additional condition, if you want to make it work for, for higher dimensions, you need to assume that you already have a path of symplectic forms, which is something that comes for free in dimension two. In higher dimensions, it doesn't come from free. You need to assume this because there are contour examples. Okay, so what is a symplectic structure in general in higher dimensions? Well. It's given, I'm going to copy the definition from the two-dimensional case. It's given by a closed two form, so a two form such that differential of omega is zero. And now I need to make some sense of the definition of non-degenerate. In dimension two, it's enough to say that omega is positive. As an area form, that's enough. And in higher dimensions, a way to define non-degeneracy, okay, I'm going to give you two ways and you choose what you prefer. They are equivalent. One way is to say that <clears throat> by copying the idea of the proof that I gave here, what we need, the most important part of this proof is that this equation had a solution, this equation here. That's the most important part. 
So this is what we need indeed. What we need, the definition of non-degeneracy <coughs> is the definition is the following. Omega is a two form, okay? Now, if I put here a one form, we require that this equation <coughs> has a unique solution. Here, the data as, as before, Here, the data are going to be the, this two form, this one form, that's data. <coughs> Sorry, an omega, that's data. And this is the unknown. So we say it's non degenerate if given omega non degenerate. If given for every beta, there exists a unique vector field which is a solution of the equation. That's what we need. That's the definition of non-degeneracy. Maybe you find it strange. Another way to understand this definition is this is a, a close to form, okay? And one thing to understand, this is indeed equivalent to taking a, a, a local patch and computing this omega, this two form in, in local coordinates will, will be expressed as omega ij dxi. Let me do this smaller. If you write this in local coordinates, you can always write omega, omega as the sum of omega ij's dxi with dxj. This will be the local expression. This has advanced for me. What did it do? Okay. This would be the local expression. Okay. So one way to understand this non-degeneracy is to understand that if I take the matrix by the omega ij's, this determinant is different from zero. That's equivalent. Favorite definition, you can choose this one that doesn't depend on local coordinates or you can take local coordinates and the definition is very close to the area form. In the area form, we assume that the area is positive. Here we can assume that the determinant is different from zero. And that's enough because this is equivalent if you write this down in local coordinates to this equation to have a unique solution, okay? Well, this equation that uh, seems to be inspired by Moser, indeed Moser himself was, in, was inspired by a most basic equation, which is the equation of a Hamiltonian vector field. Okay. Well, here I say something that people in algebra will like. This is a non-degeneracy gives me a natural isomorphism between the cotangent and the tangent bundle. And that's magic, right? Because uh, if you, you take a one form, this gives you, you take a section of, of this cotangent bundle, you take a one form, this gives you a unique vector field, okay? And in, so important objects are Hamiltonian vector fields. And this is indeed Hamiltonian vector fields, the equation, is exactly the one that I was given here for non-degeneracy with the difference that I take as a one form, an exact one form. So I take the differential of a function, okay? And then I say that the vector field is Hamiltonian if it's the unique solution to this equation, okay? That's an equation that looks very much to the equation that Moser used to prove equivalence. Probably he was inspired by Hamilton's equations, okay? Why, I, I mean, and this is something that you say, well, uh, many of you have seen Hamiltonian vector fields in different contexts. And, and now you say, is it true? Is it the same definition of Hamiltonian vector field that I have in coordinates? Uh, yes, yes. And the surprise comes in the following. This could be, uh, this is a, an exercise, very easy exercise. This is an exercise just for warming up. 
So adds a size, but it's nice to make this computation. I think that's a good exercise for beginners that if you take on, now I'm going to take a, a, a particular class kind of, um, of symplectic form. I'm going to take a symplectic form of this type, DQI, okay? Then if you take this form and you consider as a manifold, I'm going to say R to N with this form, it's easy to check that the Hamiltonian, the equations of the Hamiltonian vector fields, equations, so uh, equations. So let's say better yet, let me say it differently. The flow, what I want to say is that the flow of uh, the Hamiltonian vector field associated to H, which is a function, coincides with Hamilton's equations. So why is this so? Why is this so magic? Go and check it. It's an easy exercise. Indeed, Pau, add this to exercise zero in the list. We don't have this. We have more sophisticated ones. But I think it's good the first time you, you enter in this topic. Pau is there. Thank you. Uh, it's good to, to make this computation with your, with your hands, to, to check what does it mean to do a contraction of a vector field with a two form, et cetera. I mean, uh, all of you know this from calculus, but it's good that you, that you check here that you have a unique uh, solution. And then you end up finding that the coefficients of these vector fields are given by this uh, coincide with these coefficients here that you have here, okay? And this means that the flow the equations, the, the Hamilton's equation are just the equations of the flow of the Hamiltonian vector field with respect to this uh, symplectic structure. Well, you could think this symplectic structure here, Eva, that you are putting in this exercise is too peculiar, is too easy. In particular, look that all the coefficients are constants. Uh, is this reasonable to assume that you can have such a structure on your manifold and the surprise comes with a magic uh, theorem i'm going to uh, go a little bit here uh, which is the root theorem the root theorem tells me that locally any manifold in a neighborhood of a point your the symplectic structure can be written this way that's surprising right that's true. This tells you that, in particular, that in a neighborhood of a point, if you think about classification problems, all symplectic manifolds of the same dimension look the same. By the way, I didn't say this, but why to n? Well, the condition of non-degeneracy imposes, if you, if you write it down, the only way you can do a determinant there the only way you can have a determinant different from zero is that, the, that the, your manifold is even dimensional. So symplectic manifolds are always even dimensional, guys. And while this theorem by the rule, you can prove it with the path method. Surprising. I'm going to tell you in one line how to prove it with the path method that I explained before. So, well, examples of symplectic manifold, and that's good to have some examples always in mind, any orientable surface is a symplectic manifold. A fabulous example are cotangent bundles. Cotangent bundles having a symplectic form, the differential of the Liouville one form. And that's an exercise in the list, okay? Uh, that's, one of the, uh, that's one of the first exercises in the list. One important thing is that classification problems for symplectic geometry in dimension two are hard, and Mosser's path method is still 
the most famous street to construct simplex domorphies. For even here, I had uh, left some space for proofs in order to prove the root theorem. And I can do this now very quickly because I spent uh, 10 minutes or more with the actual proof of this theorem by Mosser about classification, global classification of symplectic forms. Well, the proof of the Darboux, of the Darboux theorem is very easy. It just requires a little bit of flexibility of thought. I want to prove, okay, that for any point on a symplectic manifold that now I already write like even dimensional because I know it's even dimensional, there exists a neighborhood of the point and some local coordinates x1, y1, xn, yn, such that omega is the sum from 1 to n of the differential of xi to the differential of yn. How do I prove this? Well, first, the, the most important thing about this proof <coughs> is to understand this uh, local norm, this, this structure. The structure that we have here, so proof. The structure that will, uh, that will local normal form, which is this structure here, which is constant. I'm going to call it omega zero. Indeed can be thought as a differential form, as a symplectic form on a vector space. And indeed here, uh, a way to understand this, a very, uh, you may think a bit eccentrical, but let's say elegant way to understand this, is to take the exponential map from the tangent bundle of your point to, to the manifold, okay? The classical exponential map well, if I talk about exponential map, I take, to, I take an auxiliary with respect to an auxiliary metric, which doesn't matter which metric I take. I can throw it afterwards, it doesn't matter. I take the exponential map and exponential map tells me indeed that I can work, that a neighborhood of a point is like a neighborhood of the tangent space. Therefore, why I say this? Because it's convenient to visualize this form as a constant form, it's a constant form, and I can visualize this as a form on a vector space. And in a vector space, we, if it's even dimensional, I can always think that my, my, my space is uh, of this type. If it's even dimensional, I can take as a standard form there, uh, the classical form, that I can take, I can take any form, okay? Uh, I can think of this, for instance. And I can take of this, I can think of this, uh, I can take uh, phi x prime minus phi prime x. And this would be an example of anti-symmetric, which is coordinate free. Okay, and then what's what's very easy to prove is that because of linear algebra, we can always find a symplectic base. We can find a symplectic base. This justifies that in a neighborhood of a point, I mean, I have my initial symplectic form and then I can always consider, I can always use the exponential map to take the form that is given by this symplectic basis. I can find a symplectic basis. And a symplectic basis of, of this symplectic uh, structure, it means that I have a basis of type EI FJ, such a way that these guys pair as the delta Kronecker, and the uh, and that's the way they they pair. Therefore, 
So what I'm saying now is that the way to start is you have your initial symplectic form. And then you need to consider this symplectic form, uh, which what is the sense that you can give to this symplectic form? Well, you can take some local coordinates and just write it down. But what I want to say is that this is intrinsic, that I can think that I take the symplectic form given by the exponential, by taking the standard symplectic form given in a symplectic basis. So if you write omega on a symplectic basis, then what you get is omega zero. And this xi and yi are coordinates on the symplectic basis. So indeed you can do this by linear algebra. This proves that you can have, that you have what you have, I mean, if you have a vector space, you have a unique way of writing these forms. Then you take this, this omega zero and you can pull it, you can take the exponential mapping to take it to the manifold. This gives an intrinsic sense to this constant form, okay? And now what's left to do once, well, once this is understood that I have explained in full detail here, once this is understood, the only thing you need to do is to now apply path method that I explained to this omega zero and omega one. And this gives you automatically the phi t Exactly, it's the same proof. I mean, there are some, some things I didn't comment. Why, do you, why can you integrate uh, with respect to T? In the, in, the, in the surface case, it was for compact surfaces, you were using that the flow is a fine uh, for all T on a compact manifold. It's an it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ordinary differential equation, okay? And here, well, you, you, you only need to assume that this is the fine in a neighborhood of the point. And an important point, why, you, why this equation has a solution in the local case is that uh, when you write this thing, because the two forms, because you are working local, local hypocale lemma tells you that this beta exists, is that you can check that this beta equals zero on the point. And this guarantees that you can integrate this, this flow, that this flow exists. So you just apply the same proof and then you get equivalence. You get that phi one start omega one, where omega one is your initial symplectic structure, pulls back to omega zero, which is your Darboux form. Okay, where here I explained that this is the Darboux form, but this is just the, the, this is, I mean, just to summarize everything I have explained here, because it was a bit hectic, maybe, that this double form, you can think of it, okay, as the form expressed in some symplectic basis of the, of the tangent space. And then it makes sense. You have a unique expression, okay? And that's the proof. Indeed. That's the proof of the Arbut theorem. Okay, I have made two proofs. Now I can stop making, I will not make more proofs. That's enough for the first uh, lesson. I just want to say, that uh, some of you may ask, well, if symplectic manifolds are even dimensional, what happens with R3? We live on a three dimensional manifold. I mean, uh, we don't like this geometry, but if you think about the problems in physics, you usually think about the point and the velocity of, the, of, of your problem in physics. This is the same as, as already thinking on formulating your three-dimensional problems on six dimensions, indeed. But okay, is there an, an analog of symplectic geometry for all dimensional manifolds? The answer is yes. And that's the, the case of contact manifolds. Uh, contact manifolds, they are going to appear in two sessions. So I will go back to them, but uh, just to say, in order to have a little bit the ideas clear, that in the symplectic case, the idea, the, the, the short uh, thing we need to know today is that we have a manifold given, uh, uh, that the, the geometry is given by a differential form, okay? That's the case of symplectic and contact manifold. In the symplectic case, this differential form is a two form, which is non-degenerate and closed, okay? And in the contact case, this is a one form, which satisfies this condition here, 
This condition here is equivalent to non-integrability of the kernel of this malform. Let me explain using this nice picture. This picture here is precisely a picture of the standard uh, contact structure on R3. The standard contact structure on R3 is of this type. This is the one form. So alpha is this at minus x dy. So here I'm looking a little bit at the kern. Okay. So we may look, that's the one form I consider. And then I consider, I can consider the kernel of alpha. And then if I look at the kernel of alpha, I get at each point two vectors, but these two vectors don't integrate to a two-dimensional manifold. They don't satisfy, the kernel of alpha doesn't satisfy Frobenius theorem. That's why I say it's non-integral. If you make a picture, you, it, mo it moves in all the possible three dimensions as you move the point on the manifold. This is what this picture is trying to tell us, okay? In the symplectic case, what is this carbon doing here? Well, it's adding a little bit of entertainment at this point of the talk, but it's also uh, wants to uh, attempts to uh, to mention a famous theorem in symplectic geometry, which is the non-squeezing theorem that I will not talk about today. But it's about putting a cylinder. You cannot put a cylinder in such a ball if you don't have the right relations uh, ratio between the diameter of the cylinder and the diameter of your of your ball. And uh, what the camel, why a camel through a, a needle? Because this is inspired by the by the saying of the Bible that a camel cannot enter in the in well, I don't know it by heart, but it's about that the that uh, the camel will not that it would it's more difficult than blah blah enters the heaven than a camel can squeeze through a needle through the hole of a needle, and that's a little bit the idea of and that's why this camel is here just and also entertaining, and here is us looking at ourselves at the mirror that uh, between the even and the odd dimensional case, okay? So what I say is that this is the standard contact structure on R3. Indeed, we also have other theorem for contact structures, which tell us that locally all of them are going to be like that if they are three dimensional. And then in, in, the, in, the, in the case of uh, symplectic geometry, what's important are Hamiltonian vector fields in the case of uh, contact geometry, what's very important are red vector fields and also Hamiltonian. In order to define Hamiltonian vector fields, we need to set a little bit to normalize what is called the red vector field, which is the only solution to the equations, to these two equations. That's the red vector field. And, one, and, and then, and this is like a, the first talk, so motivation for things. What are the kind of problems that people look in, uh, in symplectic geometry and in contact geometry. Well, one problem is the classification, okay? And if you look at the classification theorem for two-dimensional manifolds that we have proved, which is Mosser theorem, you may want to generalize to higher dimensions. And the truth is that the generalization to higher dimension doesn't happen uh, that easily. There are a lot of invariants in general, but there is a class of manifolds which are called toric manifolds uh, that, uh, that allow classification scheme for symplectic manifolds in higher dimensions. And that's a pretty theorem, uh, which is the following. If you have a symplectic manifold that admits uh, an action of a torus, which is of maximal dimension, which is half the dimension of your manifold. It's a torus of dimension m, and we assume that this action is effective. Effective, it means that all points of the manifold are moved by some point of the group, okay? So that's a toric symplectic manifold. Then a beautiful theorem by Del Sun tells you that you can completely classify these manifolds by looking at something that comes, that has a name that comes from classical mechanics. Because indeed, 
the motivation and all the examples come from classical mechanics, which is the moment map or momentum map, if you want. The momentum map, okay, uh, here we have these two dimensions. This, this, this would be the image of the moment map. This is two dimensional and the image is always half the dimension. This means that this triangle here stands for some toric manifold of dimension form. And this guy is CP2. CP2 is over this guy here. That's uh, the classification. And here you have the, the, the torus action. So indeed, we are going to deal with actions in, in this uh, course. So if you don't know about Lie groups, it's not a big deal because I will just consider a billion case in this, in this course. I will consider actions of torus, okay? On a manifold. So this action here has the property that uh, there exists a moment map, okay, from M to G star. Okay, and here G star, it's the dual of the Lee of the torus. Sorry, this jumped. Okay, and here the condition of moment map essentially tells me, of course, the, the moment map goes to the dual of Ali algebra. And when I just see the dual of Ali algebra, the most judicious way, so if I do mu of x, this guy here is an element of the dual of the Lie algebra. How do you understand the dual of, the, of, a, of an object? Applying always to an element of G. That's how you understand it. Because it's duality, okay? So this guy here, what is this guy? This guy here now maps by duality to R. So this is just a function, okay? So what you impose is that this function here, okay, is the Hamiltonian function. That's the impo what you impose, Hamiltonian function of a vector field. And which vector field do you consider? That this is the Hamiltonian function of the fundamental vector field of the action. Okay, so why consider uh, Toric manifolds? There are many reasons to consider Toric manifolds. One of them is if I'm interested in classification problems, the, the, the all Toric manifolds are classified by their image. And their image, the surprising thing is that it's just a polytope on, an, on a manifold, which is just Rn, where n is half of the dimension of the manifold. So essentially, this theorem, which is a powerful theorem by, by Delsan, Delsan turned 60, indeed, some, they, he, had his, uh, he had his birthday uh, some weeks ago. So he's alive, I mean, he's 60. He's, we could say he's still young, right? I mean, when you are getting older and older, uh, I mean, your concession towards uh, people who are older is, is, is you become more generous. So 60 is young. So he's alive, I mean, he's, he, I mean, this, this happened in, it's a result of 88, which uh, of course, all of you were born after that eight, that, that year, but it's relatively young results, but it's very powerful. This is telling me that if I do linear algebra here, essentially, this is the same as doing symplectic geometry here. And that's a powerful tool. Another thing, another reason why I like toric manifolds is that they provide examples of integrable systems. And integrable systems are going to be important because uh, one approach, uh, well, one approach, one possible approach to symplectic geometry is that you want to study problems in perturbation theory. Okay, for that you need to start somehow with something that is uh, non-generic. Okay, but for which you, you have a complete understanding of what's, what's going on, and that's an integral system. Here, because it's the first day, I want to give some panorama of, in, of problems uh, in symplectic and, geom and contact geometry. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, problems about classification, obstructions, and existence uh, theorem, and a natural question is, do I have 
a, a contact structure on any given manifold, for instance. This was solved a couple of years ago by Borman, Elias, and Murphy, who proved that in any dimension, if a manifold has a property which is called almost contact, then it's contact. So uh, let's say the only abstraction is therefore topological for a manifold to admit a uh, contact structure. So these are the kind of problems that are considered. Some problems that many people are interested in are the study of periodic orbits, of the Hamiltonian vector fields or ramp vector fields. And essentially, when we say periodic orbits, it's about existence and abundance of, of orbits. And in this course, I will mention, not now, but later on, Meinstein conjecture and Arnold conjecture are going to be very important for us. And, and then uh, towards the end, and this, this is really about my last session, towards the end, uh, this is like the saying is, let algebra be your friend, okay? Why? We want to count periodic corbits using uh, what is some homology, using floor and counter homology. And that's a little bit a good panorama of the kind of problems we, we, that are uh, important in symplectic geometry. And we will address some of these problems in the context of singular uh, problems, okay? So as I said, uh, the, the guiding conjectures that have been guiding the last year are, is Weinstein conjecture. Weinstein conjecture asserts that the revector field of a contact compact manifold admits at least a periodic orbit. And this is, for instance, completely proved in dimension three and in many other cases. And Arnold's conjecture is about periodic orbits of T-dependent Hamiltonian vector fields and this, to prove the, the Arnold conjecture, was the driving force uh, to develop all this flow air theory. We could say it like that. Uh, well, this is just a little bit panorama, so I'm not going to enter into this at this precise moment. I will go to, to the Weinstein conjecture in uh, next week, and I will address the Arnold's conjecture on my last uh, lecture. Why do we care about periodic orbits? Because Poincaré already told us that they are a good first step to understand the dynamics, the dynamic we can understand that is grouped in some islands as, 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 as Poincaré is described them, describing them. And this uh, periodic orbit is just a step, first step towards understanding the dynamics. Okay. Uh, uh, I think, okay, uh, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of time and I'm going to skip. This means that I will I will address this. Uh, I had here some reminder about Lagrange and two manifolds, but I think I will. I'm going to talk about this in the third session, not not today, because I'm going to skip this part, which is the classical. Uh, in the, I mean, I will I will use this material. It's not that I'm totally skipping. I'm skipping it today. I think I can, uh, in terms of time. I want to, I will talk about this at a later session. Because now what I want to do is to, to understand, um, I'm going to skip what I had here, applications, motivation, blah, blah. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about singular symplectic manifolds. Okay. Well, what I'm skipping, don't worry too much because I'll 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 get to that in the session in which I talk about action angle coordinates in the singular set. And this was a reminder of integrable systems and action angle coordinates. But what I will do is to include this material in that class. It doesn't matter so much that I'm skipping it now. I want to to take you to the motivation of. Why do I want now to, in, to include some singularities in my problem, okay? I'm going to consider a Hamiltonian system now. Uh, so I have some Hamilton's equation. And this Hamilton's equation, by the way, physically, usually is the, what we call the total energy of your system, okay? So what I consider now is, a, 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 let's say, an easier model of the three-body problem. The three-body problem, I have three bodies that move, on the space attracted to each other, okay, each of them. Therefore, it's very complicated, right? Because you have three bodies 
Like if you have two bodies, let's say, you can understand how they are attracted to each other. Indeed, you can even write down the equations and, and, and solve the solution. I mean, this, is, this would be a solvable problem, uh, which is indeed it's solved in this previous slide because it was one of my examples of integrable systems. But if you have three problems, this looks very hard, okay? So instead of considering the more general problem, you consider what is called a restricted free body problem, which means a particular case, okay? And here the case I consider is the case in which I have about around these three bodies, okay? But uh, one of them is the spacecraft, okay? And this spacecraft doesn't have a uh, mass. So it, you can think of this as a satellite. And you can think that you have the Earth and the Moon, okay, which are the primary and the secondary. And then uh, the, their attraction counts. But now we assume that the spacecraft that can be a satellite doesn't. Then we want to understand the movement of the satellite. And then it makes a lot of sense, for instance, this question of periodic orbits, right? Because if I, if I, throw a satellite, I want the satellite back, okay? Then in this problem, of course, in these problems of satellites, of having the satellite back, if I have the satellite back, I have a periodic orbit. Then from, of course, from, a, from an abstract point of view, I can prove existence of periodic orbits, but then in practice, what's, uh, what's uh, important in practice also is that you have some perturbations going on. That's why the study of KM theory that is one of the points that I will consider in this uh, course in the case of singular uh, systems is fundamental, okay? So now what I want to do is to write down the differential equations that this spacecraft, that the trajectories of the spacecraft follows. For that, what I do is to do a problem in physics, okay? I consider uh, the total energy of my system as Hamiltonian. This is what usually happens. So let's say symplectic geometry is to physics uh, in this sense. Our Hamiltonian functions, physicists think that what we are considering is energy of the system, okay? So we consider the total energy of the system, which is uh, we need to add up uh, just uh, potential energy plus kinetical energy. So here we compute, okay? Uh, by the way, here I'm explaining this, but you have to know that this is an exercise in the list because it's, it's quite complicated, okay? I'm going to explain the equations, but I think it's important that you try to understand these equations yourself. And then there is like, there are some changes that I'm here saying, but you will do it in the class. And I think uh, uh, who, who's who, Pau, I don't know if you are going to do this or Joaquim. Joaquim wants to do this, I think, okay. Yes, I think Joachim, Joachim will be the one. Will be the one problem. who will go through this. So don't worry too much about these actual computations. You can just believe them because uh, Joachim is going to check. And OK, so here I take, this is the, the potential energy. One thing I'm doing is to assume, thank you, Paul, that uh, the problem has uh, is normalized in the sense that mu, OK, uh, I take one of the planets has uh, mass mu, one minus mu and the other has mass mu. So I'm assuming that the sum is one. Of course, this is not realistic, but I'm, I'm normalizing things as physicists do. I can do it too, okay? So the Hamiltonian is, this is the, the, this is the kinetical energy, okay? Where P is the momentum of the planet, okay? And this is the, the potential energy. So the Hamiltonian that observed depends on time, this is still dependent, is the total energy of the system. Okay, the one thing you, the one thing that is usually done is because the, in, the, in this restricted theory body problem, we consider, by the way, the circular restricted theory body problem, which means that if you don't have, if you don't see this satellite, these two planets move, in circulars, we could consider the we could consider the elliptic case, but it's more complicated. Let's consider the circular case. Then one thing you can do, and Pau, uh, sorry, Pau Joaquin will do this, is to consider the change, some canonical change to some polar coordinates. Okay, 
And then McGeehy, who is somebody who has been a long time working in celestial mechanics, introduced uh, this change. And there is a reason to do such a thing that the Hamiltonian, by the way, it's going to become uh, nice after this change. And this change changes the coordinate X to a coordinate R, okay? And what is the problem of this? Well, this doesn't have any problem when X is different from zero, okay? But one problem that indeed is uh, important in celestial mechanics is to see what happens when the satellite gets close to X equal to zero. And then uh, usually people tend to work with the symplectic business and say, well, when, it's, when it goes to infinity, it's no longer symplectic, but let's try to use the same techniques. I'm here to tell you that the right way to talk about these structures at infinity is this one. I mean, that's exactly the computation. When you, you do, you plug the error here and you do the canonical change, you get this form. This form is a differential form, which is not a smooth. Sorry. Ah, sorry, I did a disaster now. Oh. Okay, close your eyes. This is not a smooth at x equal to zero. Not a smooth. But a still, we can make sense of this form. This is something that, that we, and this is what we call singular symplectic. Okay? By the way, this makes sense to look at this thing uh, as a Poisson structure. It's easy just to dualize this and consider a bivector field and to look at this object as a Poisson structure. That's what I'm going to explain in a few slides. So there is a way to, to look at these objects as a smooth uh, objects by looking at them as Poisson structure. But it's also possible in a way what we don't like, what makes this object not as smooth is this term. If, if, we, if we had a way to consider this term here, as a generator of a module and call it dx bar, <coughs> then we could make sense of this. Okay? And that's exactly, that's exactly what we will do on Thursday. Okay. The model for the systems, so the model for the forms that I want to consider in this course is of this type. By the way, sometimes, we also get forms that are of this type. These forms, uh, indeed, these are what we call folded forms. These are also singular symplectic form. Folded forms, and this form here is what we call BM symplectic form. And it appears like in the residual three body problem. There we have observed that in the residual three body problem, <coughs> what we obtain is a B3 symplectic form. Okay. So, by the way, once, once we have the form here, uh, what I was saying is that it's easy to dualize this form. This is a differential form, a two form. <coughs> Therefore, I can try to dualize it. <coughs> Sorry. And if I dualize it, I get a bivector field. That's a bivector field, indeed, which comes just from taking the dual of this form. But this bivector field is a special. This bivector field has a property that if I take something that is called a scout and bracket, that it's, it's normal that you don't know this, okay? But you know what is the Lie, the Lie bracket of vector fields. So essentially you extend the Lie bracket of vector fields to my vector fields. And this condition here is telling me if you have a my vector field satisfying this, what you have is a Poisson structure. So we may look at these uh, structures in two different ways, with two different glasses. We can look at them 
a singular symplectic forms, or we can look at them as Poisson structures. Okay. Other examples that uh, will appear also, some of them in the list of problems, some of them in, in, further, se in further sessions. One of the structures that will appear are regularization for the n-body problem. For instance, for the three-body problem, Magihi himself has a regularization. And for the n-body problem, which is very useful for binary collisions, to study collision, uh, one does a regularization, which is the kustan heimer stiefel regularization. And then what you get is a folded type symplectic structure with some hyperbolic singularities. So this is a picture of the n-body problem, indeed the two-body problem and the n-body problem. And in the two fixed center problem, indeed you can also find some kind of regularization, which is called Appleton formation, where you get a combination of the two structures, the, the ones that I call BM symplectic and fold. This I will also try to, to cover this. If you think, uh, I mean, the motivation here was from some actual problem in physics, but if you want to think of in this, in terms of how I started my class today, you can also try to understand this. Why? Because you can think that you have an area form, okay, that goes to infinity in certain directions. For instance, take this, uh, take this uh, surface here, take the surface here, okay? You have this surface, this is a sphere, and then you just take your scissors and cut along the equator, okay? Then imagine that you have, and a good way to think about this is to, th is to think that you have chewing gum. You have chewing gum, and then you are just uh, uh, stretching out the chewing gum, okay? When you do such a thing, the area goes to infinity because you stretch out the, 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 this chewing gum, okay? So we have some area that goes to infinity, okay? But we want that it goes to infinity in a controlled way. Uh, for instance, we may want to say what control means here. It means that the two form looks exactly as simple as this for points in Z. That, that's what it means to be control. Okay. If you like, uh, let's say, this geometrical approach, you can think as these objects in dimension two, as objects where area goes to infinity, but in a control way, let's say, not too crazy. Okay. And okay, why singular? Okay, here I have uh, for you some pictures of people, all of them are smiling. So this means that this is a good uh, object to work because people are happy. So this is good. We have Victor Gilamin here smiling. This is me a long time ago, I was young. Well, not so long time ago, this is 2009 with Anarita Pires, my collaborator. With Victor and Anarita Pires, we started to study these forms, these symplectic forms. Anna, uh, Anna Canas da Silva uh, had uh, worked on folded forms. My collaborator here, uh, Jonathan Weitzman, with whom we have been addressing especially for problems uh, in convexity and problems in quantization. And here, uh, Melrose, uh, this is Magihi, uh, here Richard Nest and uh, Montgomery. Uh, Richard Montgomery, who all of them are smiling. So this is a good topic. But if you want some formal, uh, let's say all of them are smiling, so it must be uh, cool to work with these objects. But if you want some sound uh, reasons why, why we should do this, uh, our reason is that many non-compact symplectic manifolds can be in a way compactified as these singular manifolds. We will see examples of this. The examples I showed in uh, celestial mechanics already are, are showing these singularities as regularization transformation. And also this manifolds model, uh, and, and that's indeed how uh, Richard Melrose started to work on this, uh, models on manifolds with math. And the last uh, reason is my favorite one, why not? Okay, so that's a, a good uh, reason. What are the geometries involved in this course? Okay, where are we? Okay, like this is like when you go to the shopping mall, 
you are here, okay? So we have been in this uh, class, we have been essentially in the symplectic real. And now we are timidly moving towards the Poisson real, okay? So uh, indeed, this is a rich realm because you could uh, Poisson uh, structures uh, have their holomorphic counterparts that appear natural in many problems in algebraic geometry. So if you like your motivation to be here as algebraic geometry, that's a good place to be. And of course, there is a general way which are generalized complex structure. We can always look at these structures farther and farther but we are going to, in this uh, course, essentially, no, we're not going to address all the possible generalizations, which are very interesting. We're going to stay somewhere between symplectic and Poisson. And we're going to see that sometimes it's good to zoom in. This is a flower and you are very close to the flower. Maybe when you are very close to the flower, you don't see that it's a flower, okay? Because the picture is too zoomed in. So sometimes it's good to zoom out. Indeed, the B Poisson structures that, that we have, we can think of them, indeed they are Poisson, but as a special class of Poisson, which are very close to the symplectic box. And as I said, sometimes it's good to zoom out and you know see a garden and, and have a general vision. And when we zoom out, sometimes we gain perspective. Why do I say this? I say this because these are structures which are uh, singular symplectic structure can be understood, at least the BM symplectic ones, as Poisson structures. So, okay, now I have been speaking for a long time. And I think that, okay, this is going to be my last slide. I, I, I mean, I always, it always happens. I prepare a lot of slides and then reality, reality is that I cannot do all these slides, but this is okay. I want to say you that I want to tell you that we are fine. We are doing fine. Uh, I want that this last slide to be the first slide of, of my next uh, session. As I said, okay, we have uh, manifolds. We are interested in manifolds, symplectic manifolds of this type. Okay. Also some manifolds where the form is of this type that are going to be Folded. These ones that I'm adding here in the file are not Poisson, not Poisson, but we can also consider them. They are called folded, folded symplectic. But for the ones that are BM symplectic, that have local models of this type, one thing we can do, this is the computation I have done before, is to dualize them. Then we have a bivector field that satisfies that the Scouten bracket is zero, okay? This means that we have a Poisson bracket. And how do we associate a bracket to a bivector? It's very simple. We just plug the, the, the bracket of the functions f and g, are going to be the bivector field applied to the differential of f and the differential of c. And this gives me a bracket, okay? And this is, as I say, I think that this is a good place to stop, okay? Because I want to, to what I'm going to do next session, okay? Uh, I'm going to talk about Poisson strikes, so I'm going to talk about these objects from two different perspectives, as Poisson manifolds and as uh, singular symplectic manifolds. But I think that I have been speaking for a long time and people, I don't know, do you have, I mean, this is going to be my starting part for the next session. Do you have questions? Chung. Okay, so if anyone have any questions, please. Unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello, Eva. I, I actually have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, okay. So, so uh, sorry for my uh, being unfamiliar with this toric uh, manifold, which you talk about as the main motivation for this classification uh, program. Uh, so you mentioned this thousand theorem. Uh, I would like to know. Uh, I mean, does it has anything to do with uh, 
the so-called uh, Atia uh, Gilaimin Sternberger uh, yeah. theorem. Very, yeah, 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 true. Very good question, as always. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the uh, Chung is mentioning a famous theorem, which is uh, a theorem which is indeed more general than the theorem of Dalsam. Let me take. Maybe I should leave space for proofs. This comes perfect here. I'm going to write here. Okay. So what Chung is saying, he's asked uh, talking about Diamin, Stenberg. Atilla and convexity theorem. That's a beautiful theorem. That's a theorem that tells you the following. That's more general, that you have a manifold, you have a symplectic manifold, okay? That's the setup of the theorem. You have a symplectic manifold, and then you have a group that is a torus, but is not of maximal dimension. Before we were considering, if this is dimension 2n, we were considering a torus of dimension n. Here you have a torus k, where k is less or equal than n, okay? So this is, let's say, more general because the, the case of Delsan includes just the case in which k equals n. And what does the theorem, that's the setup, well, you also know that you have here, you assume that you have this group and this group acts, usually we put it like this, on the manifold in a Hamiltonian fashion. That's what you need, Hamiltonian way. And you need to have a moment map that it's going to be the same that I described. It's going to go from the manifold, from the manifold to now the dual of the Lie algebra that it's going to be RK because this is the dual, okay? This is the Lie of the torus of dimension four. So the image is going to be also an Euclidean space, but of dimension K, okay? And what is, the, that's the setup and the theorem is telling you in a very neat way that the image of the moment map, by the way, I'm, I'm not writing it and it's very important. And the setup is that I assume that it's compact, okay? That the image of the moment map is convex, is a convex set of RK. This means that I cannot have, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I don't know I don't know how it jumped, how it decides where to jump, but we are in the space of proofs. This is space of proofs is convenient to write okay, here. So we cannot have something like this. The image of the moment map cannot be of this type because this is not convex. So this is telling you that the set maybe is not a polytone. This is more general in the sense <clears throat> that the conditions are weaker because you are not assuming that the torus is of maximal dimension. <coughs> you know that the image is a, a convex set but not necessarily a polytone. So it's more general, but you know it's convex. Right. And this is used, this, uh, by the way, thank you for reminding me because, <coughs> I'm sorry, because it's a problem of my air conditioning that gives me this, this, um, this problem that I have been all the time. Uh, so this is not necessarily a polytope. So the case when K equals N, let's say, it, this doesn't contradict the theorem, of course, the case where k equals n, this enters enters into this setup, but it's more it's a particular case. Uh, Del Sun is telling you, not only it's convex, but it is a polytope. Okay, well, so this is what the theorem is telling you. So let's say it's it's. Um, it's a more general theorem that you obtain a weaker result for k equal n. But it tells you that the moment map is a, the image of the moment map is a convex set. And this is important because uh, you can use these kind of things. Uh, the, I mean, the, the convexity theorem, we are going to use it 
for instance, in the B case, because we are going to be able to, to when we are going to prove Adelson theorem also for singular manifolds. Then we need to, to, to in a way, we, at some point, we need to use convexity. So we are going to use the theorem of Atiyah. And it's Atiyah gave a different proof than Guillem in Astana. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, thank you. And uh, just, uh, just want to make sure I got this idea correctly. So when you mentioned that, um, uh, th th this example of uh, you cut the, the, the sphere into two parts and uh, when it's approaching to the boundary, uh, you say that uh, the B symplectic uh, geometry is something we want to control. Uh, uh, the, the, the explosion is not too crazy. So you mean that uh, you can use something of the form like one over X to the power of M to bound the, the speed of uh, growth yes. of this uh, volume form? Yeah, indeed. There's something very funny going on with these objects. That if you go, you are talking about this image. I'm going to get you yes, there. Yes, yes, this sphere. Exactly. Because I think it's a nice image. Then there's something very interesting that happens when you compute the area here. If you compute the area with this form, then you may have that this goes to infinity. And you and you have that the lower part goes to minus infinity, but when you add them up, you oh. have a finite volume. So magic happens, and this only happens here. When you have indeed, when you have um, an exponent, you have some formulas. We we did this with Victor. You have some particular formulas for the volume. Uh, yeah. So control means. Exactly. Now, a natural question is, can you become crazy now and take, for instance, a form of this type? This would make a lot of sense, right? Yeah. And that's interesting. Uh, that we could also consider that a singular form. And indeed, we have a way to work with these forms because uh, let's say that the B symplectic case, that this is what in this course, I will not consider these forms. Uh, maybe I can include one problem. Pau, pay attention. <laughs> maybe we can include one problem in the list of problems. Uh, these guys here, uh, uh, we can associate, and indeed, the modus operandi of working with these singularities or with these singularities have something in common, which is that we change the glasses and we construct, indeed, we associate a Lie algebra to our problem, which we call E, okay? the Lie algebra, and then we, we look at these manifolds indeed as symplectic manifolds over a Lie algebra, which is not the cotangent bundle of M. Oh. In the B case, is the B cotangent bundle of M. In this case, these are indeed called elliptic singularities, and we started to, uh, to think about them with my friend Jeff Scott, okay? And then we, we wrote, we have a paper on this, but then many other people consider these singularities from the algebraic perspective, for instance, Brent Pin. So uh, that's a very natural object. Of course, uh, here, uh, let's say this is like an invitation to consider this kind of singular symplectic manifolds, but it makes a lot of sense to consider such a singularity or to consider an hyperbolic singularity of this type. Okay, and then there are many things you can do and there are some things that I will explain about these symplectic manifolds that you that we don't know how to do, that we do not know how to do in this more general scenario. But let's say, yeah, there is a common language for all these forms. Mm -hmm. And in this course, let's say the what I will explain is also useful for these other examples that are more general, that are different. Oh. And you can indeed you can <laughs> sorry, yeah, there is a question there. Somebody is asking something. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's the only noise. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, so yes, I did. Does this answer your question? Sure. Yeah, sure. And uh, one last thing, uh, I I I I see that you have switched from the symplectic world. Uh, I mean, be symplectic world to the uh, Poisson world by considering the dual. I, I just have a maybe stupid question uh, regarding the aspect of uh, analysis. 
So I, I think the main, I mean, if I understand it correctly, uh, the difficulty will arise when you um, consider uh, this this x uh, correct making the the zero, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, and uh, when you switch it to uh, this uh, Poisson bracket structure, which is smooth, which is uh, wonderful, uh, but I think maybe in analysis it's not for uh, free, right? Because if you now yes. you should also consider that the the thing when x goes to infinity. So it, 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 is that uh, correct or yes, I, I, yes, I, yes, yes. Let's say yeah, exactly. Let me let me say you have like this dual way. And this is going to be the starting point. There is a question by Raju, by the way, that first we are going to address this. Now, now I have, now I can see everyone and I can see the chat. That's good. So uh, yes, you are right. Let's say if we if we look at this as Poisson manifolds, there is a price to pay, okay? Which is that in Poisson geometry, things are indeed much more complicated. Indeed, what we are going to learn next Thursday, and this is a good advertisement for next, next class, is that maybe it's not so good, it's not so convenient to think of these manifolds as Poisson. Mm -hmm. okay? Okay. When you do a line and you take this X, let's say you are, let's say this is a perfectly well-defined Poisson structure, okay? But then if you think about Poisson geometry, for instance, one thing that doesn't work in Poisson geometry is the path method in general. Okay. It turns out that it works for our class of Poisson structures. So let's say we are going to walk, uh, you know, like with high heels over Poisson manifolds, okay? Because we do not want to fall down and break our 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 legs, because it's it's like a, it's a, like Poisson geometry is in it's too complicated for our manifolds. Or say our structures are genuinely Poisson structures. But to think about them as Poisson structures has some advantages and some disadvantages. Let's say we will find like the perfect balance uh, will be to think of them as symplectic manifolds over a Lie algebraoid. I will not use, I will, I'm now I said Lie algebraoid. And after uh, explaining everything from basis, I will maybe not use this expression, expression of Lie algebraoid. I will call it somewhere else. I will talk about modules, okay? And then we will, what we will do is to construct an adapted bundle that it's not going to be the cotangent bundle to our problem. Okay. Okay. Then it's essentially what we will do is uh, to put what we don't like, this X dividing inside as a generator. So we will declare one generator, like in this example of the restricted body problem, as one over X squared or X cubed differential of X. For us, this is going to be the new differential of X bar. Mm. Uh, of course, this is uh, speaking very forward and, and the right way to do it. Why can I do this? I can do this because uh, we, the, I will prove that this, uh, that if I consider the vector fields that are tangent to the critical set, they generate a C infinity uh, free module. And this will allow me to, uh, to, to have this vector map. Okay, and then I will look at sections of this bundle, and sections of this bundle will be precisely well the dual of this bundle will be these singular uh, forms, and this will be a magic moment. Okay, indeed, I have to tell you the truth. Here I'm explaining uh, the story in a most beautiful way. The truth is that when we worked with this with Victor Gilman, it took us three years to realize, well, maybe a couple of years to realize that. It was not convenient uh, the, to think of them as Poisson structure. It was better to think of them as symplectic form. And then we realized, and, and this is sort of funny story, that Melrose had already thought this way. And the funny thing is that Melrose and Victor Gilman, not only they are on the same department, but they live on the same street. So they are neighbors, okay? So this is like, you know, you are working with somebody overseas, and then you realize that your neighbor has been working on that. That's uh, that's a very interesting thing. All yeah. right. Okay, okay. Thank you. I don't know. Did that, does this reply your questions too? Yeah. Sure. Sure. I'm looking forward to uh, know more details in the in the sequence yeah. of this course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have Raju. Raju has a question. Yeah. <clears throat> I can hear you. Somebody else there is, has a question. Okay. 
Can you hear me? Raju, okay, you are first. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, thanks for your beautiful introductory lectures. I am hearing from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So uh, I'm a, I'm a physicist who works uh, generalized complex geometry in the context of T-duality, topological T-duality a la uh, uh, <clears throat> Bokneth, Epslin, Mathai, this way. So my questions is like, uh, usually this Gualteri Kavalkanti map of isomorphism between uh, current algebra, like you transport structure, like the symplectic structure or yeah. the generalized metric, the way we used to do. And there is a huge literature in string theory literature of double filter. So can we also do this for B symplectic structure that has been, <laughs> Uh, that's not perfect. That's uh, thank you very much for this question. Like, 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 uh, uh, to be precise, like this TM plus T star M2, yes. TM plus T star M. Can you do this analog that you were answering TBM? Like, you had this, uh, yes, like, are, uh, yes. Specific, yeah. yes, yes, that's very interesting. Uh, well, thank you very much for being here. That's very inspiring. That's very good that there are physicists. No, it's my, my pleasure, to okay. Hear. Thank you very much. Well, first, there are two ways. Uh, yes, yes, there are two ways to think about what you're saying. One is, as you say, you 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 try to copy the definition of generalized uh, geometry, and instead of the cotangent bundle, you plug the cotangent bundle. Okay, that's a very a very nice idea, but I mean, this is something that I told one of my students, but this is still not done. Let's say some people are thinking about this, but what is already done and I think you will be interested in this, is that if you, I mean, there is a very interesting class. I mean, you can ask the question in a different way. When you have these generalized complex structures, and now I'm talking to Raju, I mean, the people who, I mean, I have been explaining simple symplectic geometry, you don't need to understand what I'm saying, but I'm talking to him, Raju. So when you are considering this business of generalized complex structure, a very interesting ingredient is that you have a kind of four structures associated to them. You have, as you mentioned, a metric, a color structure, okay? Right. You can think as a metric, okay? But you also have an holomorphic Poisson structure hidden right. in the business. And a very interesting observation and a natural question is how is the, how, how, I mean, can you characterize, can you give a characterization of the generalized uh, structures that give you this holomorphic Poisson of B type, of our type? And the answer is that yes, this is understood, and these are the Calabria. And who did this? I mean, this is uh, proved, and you can find this in a very interesting paper uh, by Galtieri and Cavalcanti. Okay, which um, has like uh, something they call this stable generalized. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, these are, like you have these two ways, and then one interesting thing, and and relating to the string uh, business. Okay, and this is something that I still don't, I didn't follow completely uh, because this is my colleague Marco Galtieri. Marco Galtieri uh, gave a talk very recently about this interpretation, what you are saying about the string duality. And, uh, and this, this Kodanjan model. And I recommend that you follow first his talk. Yeah, I mean, you and I should follow first his talk and then try to, 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 try to see if the, this particular case, he didn't mention this in his talk, but if the particular case in which the holomorphic part is uh, um, bisymplectic or log symplectic, because this has two notations, okay, it's the same. If this part is relevant for the stream, uh, for the for the physicist, I, I would be extremely interested in that. Maybe right. this is your assignment. Maybe Raju, besides the list of problems, we can think about this. I think this is a very interesting question. Okay, like in in this context of usual, there's a B field which are non-degenerate and. It has yes. this closed db equals to zero, and it has to be invertible so that I can have the points of structure. Because otherwise, uh, if yes. determinant is zero, I cannot deal with it. Yes, uh, yes, 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 in, yes. Yeah, in this way. So, and there is a h flux sometimes. Like db is not zero. There is h flux, and you deform the current bracket with an extra term. Um, so here also in the B symplectic case, sorry for my ignorance. Like, can I do the same thing? Like, uh, I have well, a flux. Yeah, you can do this thing like in two different ways. Like one way, 
is like uh, try to copy the, the definition of, uh, as we say, of generalized complex, replacing the cotangent bundle by the by the B cotangent oh, bundle. Okay. This is this is an assignment I gave to a student, but so let's not throw <laughs> walk over the, <laughs> the the feet of the student. And the other one is 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 what I think maybe it's more interesting from a physical point of view because the first one the interpretation from physics will be something in a money in looking at a string theory or something with boundary. This for sure is going to be an interpretation. This for sure. Uh, but I think it would be interesting too, to look at this uh, class of generalized complex structure that Marco uh, uh, considers when the holomorphic part is V. And then see what is the, what, what, I mean, what is the physics of this? What is the what what does the string? I mean, he has a very nice talk that you can see. He gave it maybe twice, and it's on YouTube uh, in the in the Poisson seminar, uh, which I recommend that you that you try because uh, I think it's interesting. I mean, it's not it's not understood this, but I think it's it's an assignment more than an exercise for the list, but it's an interesting assignment. You can try to think about this. Thank so you. I, anyway. You asked if me I, a question, I, and my answer is if we should both maybe first watch this talk by Marco no. and try to understand. But it's a very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, if I don't find details or reference, I will. I hope you don't mind if I write to you to. Of course, everyone. Thanks. I mean, everyone here. Please Thank feel free to. I mean, some people are maybe too shy to ask questions, and you can send me emails. Of course. I Thank will you. Happy. I mean, I will be happy. Thank you very much. So I, I don't know. In China, it's a bit late. Uh, people are here resisting. It's it's nine ten p.m. in China, no? No. Uh, do we have more questions in Brazil? It's excuse early. me. More questions. Uh, excuse, excuse me, uh, professor. Yeah. I have some questions. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, is there any difference uh, between torus manifold and the general manifold? Between toric manifolds and and uh, general manifold. Yes, yes. Let's say toric manifolds are. Let's say not any manifold is toric. The condition of being toric, it's a, it's a, it's very specific. Okay. Uh, okay. It, okay. So uh, uh, let's say if I have a toric manifold, this manifold has to admit, for instance, the action of the torus. This already imposes some conditions on the topology. So not any manifold is, is toric, no. Let's say toric is a specific class. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have another question. Uh, yeah. When we discuss the, the difference between symplectic geometric and uh, contact geometric, I mean, could you introduce something about uh, contact geometry? Yes. Yes, and uh, my plan, thank you very much. My plan is to, is to talk about, I mean, contact geometry, I was very, very sure today, but we have a session in which we will consider this problem of periodic orbits of the, uh, of, uh, I mean, it, for instance, if we take the restricted three body problem, this example that I was introducing, this is a problem that I was explaining as a symplectic, where does contact geometry comes into the scene? When I take the energy, okay, and then I, I consider a certain level of energy, for instance. So energy H equal to constant, okay? Then, okay, uh, okay then what you get, what is what you get? Because your ambient manifold is dimension 2n, you get something of dimension 2n minus 1. You agree with me, right? Yes. Okay, then uh, there are some conditions that guarantee that you have a contact structure on this energy. So you can think, if you want, of these contact manifolds, like from a motivation from physics, that you are considering a subset of the symplectic manifold where the, where the energy is constant. Uh, you have some additional conditions, but I, I, I will, indeed, we will be totally contact in, uh, in three sessions. I have, we have one session, dedicated to escape orbits, uh, well, to the singular right and conjecture in which I will, everything I will be do, doing is contact geometry. Yes. Mm, thank you, Professor. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. More questions? Don't be shy or send me emails. A related question about contact geometry, like when you have this 2n plus 1 dimensional uh, contact manifold, usually in uh, physics, like time is uh, thought of as a different uh, beast uh, yeah. as the spatial component. So can I think the time direction as a contact direction? And then like in the Cauchy surface, like in Penrose diagram, usually we have Cauchy surface and then there is this evolution equation that we solve. Uh, solving this yeah. Cauchy boundary problem. Uh, and does this reef flow, the reef vector, reef flow, does it actually do the trick here in contact geometry? Like reef foliation, you can actually have the data and by foliation, by foliation, you can solve. And that one direction, which is 2n plus one, that is the direction of the contact structure. Something like that means, could we think, maybe it is too pro, uh, ambitious to think contact direction as the time no, direction. No, no, I think, well, I don't know enough. I, I have to confess that what you are asking me is very interesting, but I should check it out. So essentially you are trying to tell me is that if we have a, a formulation, a contact formulation of relativity. Yes, is, are there- I don't know, because... that's a very interesting question. I will look for this. I'm not, I'm not familiar with this question, but I think it's an interesting point. I mean, the dimension, as you say, the dimension makes sense. Uh, in, the, in the motivation that I was dealing, I mean, the kind of problems that I was taking as motivation, physical motivation, do not consider, I, I will look for this. I don't know, I, I, have, to, I have to look for this, but uh, I'm sure that I will find something, but it's an interesting question. Raju, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So we have like uh, Chaosen, I don't know. Do we want okay. do we... So uh, I have one question, one simple question. Okay. Uh, on your slides, page uh, 28. Okay, slide 28. Page okay. Page that's slide. That's a, a very concrete question. Okay. <laughs> then okay. I can also share again if you want. Okay, mm -hmm. 28. Okay, yeah. yeah this, uh, this is the Magihi. This is the. Okay, let me. I can also share from here. Mm -hmm. I can also share from here. Maybe it's easier if I let me open here. Mm -hmm. One second. Sure. Zoom, uh, Zoom meeting where I am. Okay. Uh, share. Okay. Here. Share. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to 20. This is quicker. 28. Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah. 28. So the of yeah. this uh, of the system. So why there's the minors, the kinetic yes, energy and yes, potential? Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay, that's that's a good question. Yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, this is the I'm using the standard rotation of the people mm -hmm. in uh, in in celestial mechanics. Usually they put this minus uh, mm -hmm. here. Okay, mm -hmm. you usually put this minus here, but it's a standard, it's a standard energy. Let's say if you want, this is a minus here. It's a notation uh, thing. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Indeed, uh, well, one interesting, one thing that it's harder about this problem is that, well, uh, this Hamiltonian depends on time. This is not so interesting. So uh, something that we will do is to consider rotating coordinates. If we consider rotating coordinates, then we will have something that doesn't depend on, on time. And this is going to be an exercise in the list, indeed, for Joaquin, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you so much. I don't know, I think that for China, thank you everyone for coming. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely very flattered to have so many people here. And I know it's very late in China, so you should also, I'm very happy to have all these students connected and asking questions here. So, but, but maybe you should, it's time for you to go to sleep. I don't know, it's 9, <laughs> 17, or to go for dinner, or to sleep, or to do the exercises, still we don't have the list, so. Yeah. No, uh, it's okay. So since, you know, in, in China, I think, you know, most uh, people have dinner earlier around, yes. uh, around six. So yes. maybe uh, before the, before your lecture, <laughs> most exactly. of us <laughs> had exactly. already had dinner. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I think you thank should. You. Have, really, thank you very much. Have lunch. Thank you everyone. It's,
Uh, okay. And thanks, Paul, for being on the panel. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I'll see you on. So the next time we, we will have another Zoom ID. May, I think uh, uh, 300 people can join. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, so you will send me this. Perfect. And I will then I will, send this. Mm -hmm. I will put this. Uh, no, exactly. So Raju is asking that. Uh, and how can we communicate? Is there a way uh, that uh, we can send an email to everyone who is connected now here? So they know the new ID. Raju is asking. If there is a change, yeah. let us know. What I, okay, so my compromise is that I will post this on the website as soon as I know. Okay, you, you, you can put it on, on your website. Let so, you send and then what I will also do is to link in the main page. So when you Google my name, you go to my mm -hmm. webpage and I will put a link direct to the course already there. So you don't need to look okay. for, the, for the link. But okay. maybe this is a good compromise. I will also circulate this among the Poisson group and maybe you can send it to the to the group of people there in Anand, no? The new the new data, and then I think yeah. this will be enough. Sure. Sure. This will be enough. Otherwise, what we can do is that somebody is connected to the other to the previous one and tells and there, if somebody connects to the other one, we put the new information in in the chat. Mm -hmm. That's also okay. a possibility, and then we connect to the new one. Okay. So okay. I'm looking forward to, to Thursday, guys. I had a lot of fun preparing the course and giving the course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you on Thursday then. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I thank Joe. Joe Palmer is connected. That's nice. <laughs> Bye. Okay.